I don't know about you, but sometimes fights in tabletop role playing games feel like a drag to me. Sure, you can punch up the action narratively, but sometimes it ends up with two sides standing next to each other. Until the dice decide who wins. Yay! Now, I've mostly been playing these d6, so the turns go around very quickly, but if you're playing some other games where you can end up waiting 5 minutes for your turn, and your only option is, I hit him with my sword, it gets sold fairly quickly. Luckily, I have been doing science. Or rather, I've been playing out of Baldur's Gate 3 and taking notes about fight scene design and what I can take back to the table. I came up with 5 points and 1 bonus tip, which maybe isn't 100% fight scene related, but will come in handy anyway. Pretty sure it's the same thing as science. I'm not planning to spend this video singing praises of this game and Larian Studios. Not because they don't deserve it, this game has won and earned every award known to man and probably a few that mankind was never meant to know. There are enough reviews of the game for you to learn about how awesome it is elsewhere. Plus, I'm not really good at singing. What I want to talk about today is why its fight design is awesome. Just know that this game is great. I had to go get myself some extra hands to give it more thumbs up. And it has a cute dog you can pet. I will try to avoid spoilers because experiencing the game yourself is great fun. Most of the examples I'm using are from Act 1. Although I did need to pull in some examples from Act 2 and Act 3. I will warn you before they come up though. Before we dig into the meat, there is a point I need to make clear. This is a video game, so it can afford to go a bit harder on the player than you can on a tabletop game. If the party is wiped out in Baldur's Gate 3, you can just hit reload and try again, as long as you're not playing in honor mode. Obviously, that doesn't translate well to the tabletop, so don't go and try to transplant things directly from the game without tuning them a little. Your players won't make it. And with that, let's get started. There are no random encounters in Baldur's Gate 3. Every fight scene happens for a reason. In the beginning of the game, they teach the player about how the game works, then they're there to further the plot, or teach the player more about the environment they are in. Now, I'm not telling you not to use random encounter tables. If you enjoy using those, go for it. But take some time to think about why something is there. For example, early in the game, you run into a sealed crypt and find these skeletons. It could have been rolled up as a random encounter, but the designers took it a bit beyond that, and gave them robes to flavor them up a bit. It sets the mood better than finding a bunch of random skeletons that attack you on sight, and that is already a step to making things more interesting. Now, to keep it interesting, we need a suitable environment. Very few of the fights in this game happen in a flat expanse. There are almost always changes in elevation, pools of water or lava, corners and nooks. Even when you're fighting in a built environment, there are usually piles of things or furniture. And these aren't just obstacles. They can be pathways between different sections of the environment, cover or even improvised weapons. This is great for several reasons. First of all, it gives sneakier characters places to hide and move around undetected. So you have more strategic options. It can also create less obvious spots to move around, which can give an advantage. Say for example, climbing over some rocks or jumping across a pit to flank your enemies. And of course, shoving your enemies into pools of lava is always good fun. One thing I liked about this game is destroyable terrain, like this platform here. The Goblin Lookout can stand there and shoot arrows at your party, but you can also break it down to make them drop. This not only makes for good action, but it can also be used to alter the encounter map during play. And by the way, if you play with miniatures, here's a link to my video about building miniature walkways and platforms like this. Anyway, all these things turn a fight scene into more of a puzzle. Once you've set up an environment which can be used to gain an advantage, fights start to rely less on dice, and more on clever positioning. Now, while a good encounter map will already encourage players to maneuver more, a little extra incentive helps. In Baldur's Gate 3, the player is constantly pushed to move. At the most basic level, nearly every enemy you fight can throw things at you. This is important because your squishy wizards can't just hide all the way in the back. Someone can still eat a rock at them. At the same time, your fighters need to figure a way to get to grips with the enemy. The skeleton fight we talked about earlier is a good example of this, as they can cast silence and fog to block out areas of the map, so you can't just sit there and shoot them or cast spells at them. Your ranged characters will need to find positions outside the blocked areas, 
while your close combat characters need to figure out a way to reach the enemy through a combination of running and jumping. Another great way of making players move is to throw in an alarm, like the goblin here. This is clearly telegraphed. The little guy shouts out before he runs for the drum, so the players know that stopping that particular goblin is now a priority. This has the added bonus of helping players pay attention if they were zoning out when it's not their turn. The situation can change quite dramatically. It also leans into the idea of making fight scenes more puzzle-like, but if you want to lean into that a little harder... There are some fights in this game that you can't win by winning, if that makes any sense. The game teaches you this very early on when you run into this fight between a devil and a mind flayer. Your objective is to get to the controls of the ship at the end of the room, and if you get stuck in the fight, you will lose. You don't really have the resources at this point to finish it in time, unless you really cheese the game. Now obviously this isn't something you want to do all the time. Running past an encounter isn't terribly satisfying. However, the idea of having an objective other than beating the crap out of everything is quite intriguing. Here's an example from Act 1. This little boy got hypnotized by a harpy song and your job is to stop them from eating him. You can interrupt the singing and let him break free, but since another harpy can pick up the song, he can end up yo-yoing backwards and forwards. So you might need someone to keep shoving him back or picking him up and running him back. Illustrated here by Shadowheart because none of the Hembo squad have any strength to speak of. I mean, you could focus on beating up the harpies and not worry about the kid. You don't really lose anything if they get him. However, this addition turns what would otherwise be a pretty uh, average scene into a very memorable one. Now, obviously you can't have a bunch of harpies everywhere in your games. Or maybe you're running The Four Horsemen, my historical dark fantasy game where there are no harpies. Well, think about the restaurant scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where they're trying to grab hold of a vial of antidote and a diamond which are being knocked around while a fight is raging. Same idea. You have a moving objective which your players need to capture and hold on until the fight ends. This works great with the next point, but since I will be bringing up some stuff from Acts 2 and 3, you might want to skip to the chapter after that if you still haven't played and don't want spoilers. In the meantime, let's all look at my little old bear buddy. He's chunky. Okay, the fifth point I wanted to bring up is about timers. Now, timers aren't anything new, and Runehammer's Index Card RPG and Professor Dungeon Master from Dungeon Craft have been advocating them for years. Short version is, you set a number of turns, and once those turns have ticked by, something happens. We've already seen an example of a timer earlier in this video, in the fight where you have to reach the controls of the ship. But the timer there is so generous it might as well have not have been there. It's more to push the player forward. Both Index Card RPG and Professor Dungeon Master use timers fairly liberally, but the way they're used here is slightly different. Whenever a timer is used in Baldur's Gate 3, it defines the entire length of the encounter. Once it's up, the encounter is over. For example, in the Nautiloid scene, if the timer runs to zero, the ship crashes and everyone dies. It's a bit drastic, but again, the timer is very generous. There's a great example in Act 2 where you have to defend the portal for a few turns. Shadow creatures will try to destroy the portal in this time, and you have to stop them. One great thing about this kind of timer is that you can throw bigger stuff at your players than they would usually be able to handle, because they only need to hold it off for a given time. Once the portal closes here, any shadows left over will disappear. Of course, there are also stakes. If you let the shadows destroy the portal, you lose one of your companions permanently, and you're locked out of resolving a particular storyline. Now, remember what I told you earlier about being able to reload your game. If you're playing this and mess up, you can reload, arm yourself and prepare yourself better, and come back. You can't do that on the table, so drop in some hints beforehand or let the players have a flat out planning session. The latter works well for you too, because then it lets you know how heavily you can push them. Another example is the Iron Throne, an underwater prison in Act 3. This is one of my favorite parts of the game, purely for the design. There are a bunch of parts here which work beautifully together. First off, it's a very small area, just a bunch of rooms and corridors. That in itself isn't terribly interesting. Your objective here is to rescue some hostages. There are only two that are critical to different plotlines, but there are a whole lot more that you can rescue if you're feeling heroic. Blocking your way are some fish people, but here's the kicker. You only have five turns to get in, free the prisoners and get out. 
At the end of the five turns, the prison collapses, and then one still inside dies. You can't get stuck in a fight with the fish people, or you will run out of time. But you can't ignore them because they will attack the fleeing hostages. Now, the game does fudge things a bit to help you. One of the key hostages starts out right next to the escape ladder, so she can get to safety in turn one. While if you did some stuff earlier, you get some help to rescue the other one. You don't really get anything extra by rescuing anyone else, except that bad attitude is its own reward. In theory, you could literally not rescue anyone at all and still complete those two plots, but the experience will be different. Now, while this could translate to the tabletop, you would absolutely need to drop some information beforehand. Like how the place is rigged to explode, there are shark people in the area, the bulkheads will seal if you start a fire inside, and so on. Ask me how I know. Dropping it on your players as presented will not work as well, because they only get to experience it once. On the other hand, it could make for a great side plot as they uh, steal the plans to the place, go over the schematics, and go Ocean's Eleven on it. While I was recording this run, I lost Shadow Heart because her potion of haste ran out on the uh, last turn. And while editing, I realized I left one of the hostages locked up right within sight of the escape ladder. While I got Shadow Heart resurrected later, that poor sword got a front row seat to the whole thing collapsing under tons of water. Let's not think about it too much and move on to the next point. Oh, look, here's the Ulber again. Who is this distinguished gentleman? One last thing I wanted to raise before I wrap up here is possibly one of the best depictions of illusion I've seen in a game. That translates beautifully to the table, and it happens in Act 1. A hag has captured a woman, and you want to rescue her. Starting out, check out the lair. It's a ring shaped around a pit, with roots and stuff around so you need to plan your movement. Second, this fight gives you two things to think about right away. The hag creates multiple images of herself, and she sets fire to the cage the prisoner is in. The copies pop as soon as you hit them, but you have to deal with them and put out the fire before the prisoner falls into the pit. Next, the hag teleports the prisoner out and duplicates her shape, so you have to figure out which one is which, or you could end up killing the prisoner instead. You could have the players figure it out via dice roll, obviously, but that isn't as satisfying as letting them uh, look for clues. For example, in this case the real prisoner was soaked because I just dunked a whole lot of water on her to put out the fire, while well, the duplicate was dry. I don't think I'd point this out, but this is a good way to reward players who ask questions. I've been rambling for a while, so to recap, these are the five main points that I want to take from Baldur's Gate 3 into my tabletop games to improve the fight scenes. 1. Give every fight a purpose. 2. Make interesting environments. 3. Make the players move. 4. Throw in the occasional side objective. 5. Use timers. If I had to summarize that into one point, I'd say it's to turn fight scenes into more puzzle-like experiences. Of course, it's always fun to roll dice, and if your players are happy with that, stick with it. But it's nice to have something in your back pocket to spice things up. Still, let me know what you think. Did this spark any ideas? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, thank you for watching, and see you again soon. Bye!